Good morning. We have general questions. Question number one, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government how many teachers are in post and how this compares with May 2007. Cabinet Secretary Michael Russell. Presiding officer, between 2007 and 2010, teaching posts fell by 3,077, with almost half of those, 48.3%, lost in just eight Labour councils. Fully one in five of these posts were lost in just one council, Labour-run Glasgow Council. Since 2011, we have had an agreement with COSLA to maintain the pupil-teacher ratio. It has remained at 13.5 in publicly funded schools, and teacher numbers have stabilised at around 51,000. That agreement remains in force for this year, and we are discussing future years with COSLA. Despite this, however, Glasgow Council continued to cut teachers, 146 in 2013. So perhaps the real question, presiding officer, is why Labour keeps cutting teacher numbers. Neil Bibby. Um, the Cabinet can Secretary can blame whoever he wants, but the facts speak for themselves. There has been a reduction of 4,000 teachers <laughs> since 2007. Can he, confirm, can he confirm teacher numbers have fallen every year since 2007, since the Scottish Government came into power, and every year since he became Cabinet Secretary for Education? Teachers, parents and pupils are concerned about the increase in pressure on the education system. The EIS have raised concerns about the possibilities of pupils being spent, sent home due to a lack of teaching supply. Can he give a guarantee that no pupils will be sent home due to a lack of teaching supply? Yes or no? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, sorry, officer, facts do speak for themselves. I gave the facts. Uh, Glasgow Council has continued to cut uh, teacher numbers. Now, we have managed to stabilise teacher numbers owing to an agreement that I secured with COSLA, I think yet again without the support of the Labour Party, who never support any reasonable actions to make sure that our schools operate well. And if uh, the member would like to continue to support me in ensuring that COSLA does not, COSLA members do not cut teacher numbers, I would welcome that. That support, and the first thing he could do is go and speak to Gordon Matheson and tell him stop cutting teacher numbers. Yeah. Question two, Richard Baker. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support the construction industry in the north east of Scotland. Minister Fergus Ewing. Uh, we continue to support the construction industry in the north east and throughout Scotland by investing in capital expenditure despite presiding officer cuts of around one quarter by the UK Government to our capital budget. In the North East, investment infrastructure has a share of the £10.8 billion local government allocation. There is continued investment in, for example, both Afford and Ellen Academy, the new Inverurie Health Centre hub, Aberdeen Royal Infirmary Campus. There is investment in the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route Balmedy Tipperty Scheme, the Aberdeen to Inverness Rail Improvements, the A96 Inveramsey Bridge, the A947 Mini Interchange Hubs, and HMP Grampian on top of the building of Merrins Academy in Aberdeenshire, to name but a few. In the interest of time, presiding officer, I have not covered the many other investments in the North East, nor those outside Aberdeen City or Shire. I'm grateful for your brevity. Richard Baker. I could suggest a few more, but the construction of the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route offers significant opportunities for the construction industry in the North East, which has seen closures and job losses over recent years. Can the Minister assure me that in concluding the final contract with the preferred bidder for the AWPR, uh, the right emphasis, emphasis will be placed on using community benefit clauses, as they will help create a level playing field for local businesses bidding for subcontracts, and also they're given the appropriate weighting uh, in tenders, because if they are weighted at a small fraction of the weighting given to costs, as they have been in the past, it will weaken considerably the impact of their inclusion in these contracts. Minister. Well, I think uh, Mr Baker does make some reasonable points there, and he will be aware that I am not personally the Minister the responsible for overseeing uh, the implementation of procurement contracts. However, I most certainly shall uh, have discussions with my colleague Keith Brown, who has that responsibility. And I'm very pleased that the Labour Party recognise the great uh, value of the investment in the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route and the Balmedy Tipperty Scheme, which presiding officer is expected to bring in an additional £6 billion £6 billion pounds to the local economy and create 14,000 new jobs, and which uh, I can assure all members is hugely welcomed by everyone in Aberdeen City and Shire. Question three, Alex Rowley. 
Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to ensure that anyone who may need help with a mental health problem can access appropriate help easily and receive treatment quickly. Minister Michael Matheson. We have made significant progress in delivering the commitments in the National Mental Health Strategy 2012-2015. Uh, for example, Scotland was the first part of the UK to introduce a target from December this year for speed of access to mental health services. We know uh, that waits of up to one in two years were common before we introduced this target. We still have further improvements to make, but the latest position shows that the average wait for access to psychological therapies is eight weeks and access to specialist child and adolescent mental health services is nine weeks, and I'm sure the member would recognise that that's significant progress. Alex Rowley. Uh, I thank the Minister for his, his response. However, given that the Scottish Association of Mental Health recently reported that in Scotland 25% of people who experience a mental health problem will, make, will wait more than a year before they actually seek help, and that additionally an estimated 800,000 adults a year won't know where to access help, would the Minister agree with me that having trained mental health first aiders in all of our communities would help to quickly identify those who need assistance and direct them to support services? And what is the Scottish Government doing to promote the mental health first aiders programme and increase the number of trained mental health first aiders in Scotland? Minister. So, you know, so I think the member makes a very good point. I think uh, it is uh, widely recognised that there are many individuals who may have a mental health problem and they can uh, leave it an extended period of time before they seek uh, assistance from uh, clinicians. And a key part of the strategy we have taken forward in order to encourage people uh, to uh, access help is through the anti-stigma campaign, the See Me campaign, in order to remove the stigma that is often associated with mental health, which can often act as a barrier to individuals uh, seeking help in the first place. Can I also say that the issue of the Mental Health First Aiders programme is a very valuable one uh, and has got an important part to play. And one of the areas of work that we are going to take forward as part of the mental health strategy is to look at how we can continue to improve access to mental health services, including aspects such as the uh, Mental Health First Aiders programme. And I'd be more than happy to discuss that matter in further depth with the member if he would find that helpful. Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, in this week of uh, remembrance, does the Minister agree with me that organisations like Horseback UK are to be congratulated in providing uh, mental uh, uh, health services for veterans uh, in, in a most unusual but very therapeutic manner? Minister. Yes, um, uh, Senior Officer, these organisations have got a very important part to play, and I, uh, I recognise that uh, the best way in which we can continue to improve uh, mental health services is through uh, that of um, uh, working with the voluntary sector and also with our statutory agencies in order to make sure that we deliver the best possible services for those who can benefit from them. Question four, Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government how many civil service jobs it has transferred to Dundee or has established in the city since 2007. Minister Fergus Ewing. Uh, Presiding officer, the Scottish Government currently has 105 members of staff working in the city of Dundee, mainly within the office of the Scottish Charity Regula Regulator and Education Scotland, and these staff move across the Scottish Government on assignment. Jenny which Labour transferred to Dundee. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government have not transferred one single civil service job to Dundee since they came to power in 2007. This is despite uh, SNP members in Dundee making their names on campaigning for Scottish civil service jobs to be transferred to our city. And these are the press releases from Shona Robison, MSP. And presiding officer... Presiding Order. officer Order. Can we get a question, Ms Mara? Order. Can we get a question, Ms Mara? We still wait for the 750 renewables jobs that the SNP government promised Dundee. What progress, Minister, is the government making on Minister. that? Minister. Um, officer, I'm unaware of having received any specific suggestion put to me by the member or, 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 or I'm unaware of having received any specific suggestion, any 
positive construction, constructive suggestion either from the member or from her party involving any specific public body or part thereof being relocated to Dundee. May I gently point out, presiding officer, that it is open to the opposition to put forward <coughs> policy proposals. Can I, can I respond, however, by saying that Dundee is a great city to which the Scottish Government is entirely devoted and supportive. And amongst that, support has included £26 million of capital from NHS Scotland's Pharmaceutical Special Service, an announcement recently of Dundee Community Care Centre of £20 million, two new schools, reprovision of the Adolescent Mental Health and Patient Service, and also, and also of course, the VNA on the Tay, which will create local jobs and contribute significantly to the regeneration of the city, a project of £45 million. On these benches, we are entirely supportive of the City of Dundee. We are investing in the City of Dundee, and we will continue to do so. Can I just gently point out to ministers and members that if we're going to make progress, the questions and the answers need to be a bit shorter. Question number five, Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what importance it places on the delivery of a high quality music experience for primary school children. Cabinet Secretary Michael Russell. Presiding officer, we attach great importance to the delivery of a high quality music experience for all children, including those in primary schools. Every school pupil is entitled to a broad general education within Curriculum for Excellence. This includes specific experiences and outcomes in music education in the expressive arts curriculum area. The provision and delivery of education services, including music, is of course a matter for each local authority to decide based on local need, circumstance and spending priorities. The Scottish Government has invested a total of £107.5 million into the Youth Music Initiative over the past 12 years. Bruce Crawford. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response, but is the Cabinet Secretary aware that Stirling Council's Labour Conservative Administration has again brought forward a savings option to remove special music teaching that will have a huge impact on the musical experience of about 6,000 pupils? Does the Scottish Government share my view that to bring back this savings option after only after eight months having discounted it, will have a severe impact on the morale of music teachers involved and will leave parents and parent council members feeling they have not been listened to and this is no way to treat people. Minister. Uh, I hear noises off which, who, seem to be arguing, who seem to be arguing that all education should be entirely run from the centre. That was the burden of Mr Bibby's question. It's the burden of what I've heard from the benches muttering when Mr Crawford was asking the question. If that is their position, let them put that forward. If it is not their position, then let us recognise that when local authorities make their decisions, they are subject to review and, yes, sometimes criticism. I am aware of this proposal. It's a disappointing proposal, particularly, particularly particularly given the work of David Green and the work he did supported across by all parties to make sure, indeed, Mr Green's report, part of it was launched at an event sponsored by a Labour MSP. There should be a, a priority given to music education, and I am sorry, I am sorry that this cut is back on the, on the agenda. I hear Labour members still shouting about it. If they want a centralised service, let them call for it. If they don't want that service, let them come up with idea, some idea, any idea, because usually from Labour, there are no ideas. Richard Simpson. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would agree that every single local authority in Scotland is facing another round of savage cuts, and in doing so, they have, they have been forced to examine every potential saving, however unpalatable many of these are, to every member in this chamber. And until the government actually stops the council tax freeze, which is not a progressive tax, which is not a progressive tax, and which Labour in its manifesto said would stop after two years, until you release local authorities from the straitjacket that you've imposed on them, they will continue to have to examine unpalatable cuts. First minute, eh? Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, presiding officer. There are so many answers to that. I almost don't know where to start. Let's start. <laughs> let's start with the Dunfermline by-election, in which the Labour Party argued they'd invented the council tax freeze. Now, apparently, 
Now apparently, now apparently they don't even want to acknowledge it. Now the reality of the situation is that local authorities make their decisions on education within the context of a budget which has been protected by this government. This government has worked incredibly hard to protect that government, but and this is a big but, presiding officer, there are consequences of actions. Uh, and if Dr Simpson was arguing some months ago that we were better together, then let him prove it, because it looks to me in financial terms it simply isn't true. Question six, Nigel Dodd. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress this has made on the provision of a grade-separated junction for the A937, A90 at Lawrence Kirk. Minister uh, the Scottish Government is committed to identifying a robust solution for access to Lawrence Kirk as soon as possible uh, and is currently working with partners in Estrans and Aberdeenshire, Aberdeenshire Council on this. A public exhibition on the options at Lawrence Kirk is planned for January, where the outcomes of the study will be shared prior to finalisation early next year. A decision will then be taken with our partners on a preferred solution that best meets the objectives for improving the A90 at Lawrence Kirk. Nigel Dawn. Thank you. I thank the Minister for his reply, but I would draw his attention to information from Transport Scotland, and I'm quoting that, determining applications for planning consent in Lawrence Kirk, we have maintained our position that no new development should proceed before a scheme of grade separation is delivered. As I read that, Minister, that means that nobody can have a planning application, either for housing or a business, passed until we have a grade separated junction. I'm wondering, Minister, how on earth we're going to get past this impasse. Minister. Well, of course, the planning decisions are taken by the planning authority in relation to this. Transport Scotland can, of course, and are obliged to make recommendations, and their priority is and always will be to make sure that we maintain the record of road safety. On that particular road, uh, no fatal or serious accidents since 2005, and we want to protect that record and continue that. But the principle, of course, is that local authorities will take decisions on planning matters. For my part, I am willing to be as flexible as possible with the local authority in how we actually phase this. I have also asked officials to establish a meeting with the local authority and with Nestrans to see if we can advance the uh, report as fast as possible that I mentioned earlier and to see that we can come to a solution. People want to develop in this area. We want to have the best possible road safety record as well. Those two things should come together and I am intending to make sure that we do that. Question 7, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government how it will encourage and support small businesses to pay employees the living wage. Minister Fergus Also, the Scottish Government fully supports the living wage campaign, and we recognise the real difference the living wage can make to the people of Scotland. The Scottish Government is the first and the only government in the UK to include the living wage in its pay policy, and we have done so for the past five years. Although we are not able to set pay levels in the private sector, we encourage all public, private, and third sector organisations to ensure all staff on lower incomes receive a fair level of pay. To that effect, the Scottish Government are funding a pilot by the Poverty Alliance with the aim of increasing the number of employers across Scotland paying the living wage. And I'm pleased to say that the number of accredited companies in Scotland has tripled since that work began earlier this year. Dr. Um, uh, Minister, I welcome the progress that has been made, but many, however, including myself, believe that ultimately over time Scotland's minimum wage should be brought in line with the, the living wage. Does the Minister agree with me that control over all levers of taxation, particularly in this instance national insurance, could support businesses moving towards the living wage and that ultimately control over the minimum wage itself should be devolved to Scotland so that in the future we can work towards placing the living wage on a statutory footing in Scotland for all workers, public or private? Minister. Uh, officer, the Chamber may be unsurprised to learn that I entirely agree with Mr Dorsey's sentiments and views, and because the UK national minimum wage has not increased in real terms in nearly a decade, and every year since 2008 has failed to increase in line with the cost of living. So, of course, the Scottish Government is clear that uh, we need new powers here substantively to address the issues of low pay. And I'm delighted that our First Minister, and since this is my last occasion on which to say so, our esteemed... <laughs> First Minister has announced plans to establish a Fair Work Convention on the 15th of October 2014. What another golden legacy to add to his collection. Thank you. Before we